विषय भारत और भारत और भारतम वी आर नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट नेशनलिज्म द वर्ड भारत और भारत एस थ्री कॉम्पोनेंट्स भा मीन्स सेंसेशन When I say sensation, your whole experience of life is a sensation. Maybe not sensation all, but it's a sensation. What you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, you only experience it as a sensation. As the basis of your current experience of life is essentially through the sense organs. Everything that you know as life is actually a sensation. Pain, pleasure, taste, smell, hearing, visual sensations, everything is happening as sensations. So this is the bha or the fundamentals of your experience. Ra means ragha or the tune. The tune is not yours. The process of creation, the source of creation has a set a tune. You cannot set the tune, the tune is already set. Life is happening to a certain tune. Tha means the rhythm, this is yours. If you get the tala right, the raga is already set. The experience of life is happening. Everything that you see, everything that you hear, smell, taste and touch is creating waves of sensations. And it is happening to a certain tune. If you get the rhythm or the tala right, you will ride the raga. Life becomes beautiful. If you do not get the tala right, life will crush you. This is all the experience of life is. Those who got the rhythm right, they think in their experience life is a wonderful thing. Those who did not get the rhythm right, those who failed to get the right tala, their experience of life is misery. They feel crushed by everything around them. So this is not about nationalism, this is about setting a culture where everybody can find the right rhythm. For the same raga, there are a million rhythms that one can set. This is individual capability as to what kind of rhythm you're going to set. So this ancient culture, which goes back twelve, fifteen thousand years, focused on mastering as to how to set the right rhythm, how each human being, irrespective of who he or she is, how to set the right rhythm. There is no one rhythm. All of us cannot dance to one rhythm. Everyone has to set his own rhythm, but it has to be in tune with the raga, otherwise they will get crushed by the process of life. It doesn't matter, you think you're a good man, you will anyway get crushed. It doesn't matter, you think you're bad, you'll get crushed. The whole world thinks you're bad but you may be doing great because you got the rhythm right, you got your tala right, everything is fine with you. <clears throat> Many thousands of years ago, a king was named after this. He was known as the emperor Bharata. He was the first demonstration of a democratic passing of power from one generation to another because when he became old, he had five sons, all of them aspiring to become kings. But he put all of them aside and chose Bhumanyu, who was the son of sage Bharatavaja. Bhumanyu grew up in the forest. 
he had no experience of being a king or living in a palace or being in a court. He grew up in the forest with his father. People said, how can this boy be a king? He's not a king's son, first thing, and he's grown up in a forest. So Bharata said, when I look into his eyes, I see intelligence. When I look into his eyes, I see stability and physically he's well built. He has a good body, he has a good brain and he's stable, he will make a great king. And he passed on his empire into the hands of Bumanyu when five of his sons were still waiting. First demo of democratic movement of power from one generation to another. As a culture, why Bharata becomes important is, this is not about a particular nation, this is about setting a culture where every human being gets the opportunity to aspire for the highest, that he will not get tangled up in just earning a living, he will not get tangled up in just fulfilling his survival and procreation processes, but he will constantly aim at something higher, he will constantly strive and aspire for something bigger than survival. If you look back on the history of this culture, we have excavation… excavated sites which are talking about over eleven thousand years of history. If you look at ports, the oldest ports in the world were built in India, if you're not aware of this. Lothal, which is in Gujarat, is dated to be nine thousand five hundred years old. This is the only port structure still found beneath the water, where they built a port which could berth and service ships in any season. Their understanding of the tidal movement was so fantastic, they built it in such a way that it never gathered silt. Very close to the Sabarmati Delta and Sab Sabarmati River is known to shift its flow very often. In spite of that, even today in this site, there is no accumulation of silt. Their understanding of the ocean and the river was so sophisticated, 9,600 years, 9,500 years ago is the date that they have fixed. A much older port here down in Tamil Nadu, which is 11,600 years old, which is the Pumpuhar. Busy port, 11,600 years ago where ships berthed and they were serviced, they were loaded and they were unloaded. The… the… the structure went down at the beginning of the… you know, the end of the ice age when it happened, when the ice melted and the ocean went up by about two meters, it went down just beneath the surface of the current where the water is, it is even today. Why I'm telling you this is, a spiritual culture does not mean they are lethargic and lazy, they just sit with their eyes closed. These are not men who stayed home, they went across the world. The first navigation from any part of the world happened from here, they navigated across the world. There are… there are records and legends of people reaching South America, exchange of cultures, people. It is just that when invaders came in recent times, in the last fourteen hundred years or so, their essential goal was just to obliterate history because people rise and fight only when there is pride about something. So first thing they will do is change your name so that you don't know who you are. <laughs> and next thing they will write… A do is rewrite your history. Everything that was written, uh, largely most of the Indian history that you're reading today was written by the British and they made it in such a way that nothing is more than three thousand years old. 
So all history was limited within three thousand years, archaeologists and others, it doesn't matter. And uh, wherever they went, whoever they saw, in any part of the world, they called them Indians. <laughs> Columbus goes west and calls them Indians, somebody comes east and calls them Indians. <coughs> this renaming of people is always very important to conquer and rule. This was Though there were many political entities everywhere in the world, we were known as Bharat or Hindustan. When we said Hindustan, we were not talking about a particular religion because this culture predates all religion. When there was no idea of religion, we were an evolved and sophisticated culture. Religion is an import from outside. We never identified ourselves as religion, the word Hindu meant he referred to the Himalayas. Du referred to the Indusagara, the Indian Ocean as it is called today, was referred to as Indusagara, the land between Himalayas and Indusagara was referred to as Hindustan. It's a geographical identity which slowly somebody rubbed it on our faces and said, you are Hindus by religion. Actually, no Hindu knows which religion he is because he doesn't even know whom to worship. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Confused? One day you go to Shiva temple and somebody says, no, Krishna temple is better, you go there and another day somebody says, Muruga temple is better, you go there and… and it's okay. In the same family, if there are five people, five people are worshipping five different gods and we have no issue. So there never was a religion, first of all, there never was a god, that's the most important thing. <clears throat> Till the Abrahamic religions entered, we never had the idea that there is a god up there who whenever he has nothing to do, he will create something <laughs> There was no such thing. This was a very cosmogenic culture, never a God-oriented culture. It is not… when you say a God, a God, you are talking about dictatorship, not about democracy. Yes? <laughs> if he decides everything, it's dictatorship, isn't it? So there never was a God, but we have millions of gods. So where did all of them land up from? Well, everybody created their gods, but they forgot. We remember that we created our gods. It is just that because a very dominant Western culture came and ruled, slowly Indian people became shy of creating gods. Otherwise, everybody is supposed to create his own Ishta Devata and worship their own favorite god. I have done a a few. What have you done? <laughs> so what is this God-making business? Is it a play or is it an entertainment? No. See, human beings are who they are on this planet in relationship to every other creature on this planet only because of the tools that we have created. If we did not have the tools that we have, we are nothing, we are not comparable to other creatures, they are much stronger, they would have us all finished. If we did not have the tools that we have, many other animals would have dominated us today, isn't it? It's only the tools. So tools are not only in terms of screwdrivers and swords and guns and whatever, we found subtler tools to give us access to deeper dimensions of life. These tools, we worship them as gods. Whenever I refer to Dhyanalinga or Devi as a tool, 
some of our devotees will get very upset. I tell them, don't ever forget that it's a tool. And a tool is not a simple thing. A tool is something that just enhanced you from being a small little human being into phenomenal possibilities, isn't it? It is a subjective tool. It can enhance you into things that you have not imagined possible. It can open up doors to dimensions that you never thought was possible. So, our idea of God has always been that it is a tool, it's a doorway that we can open and explore. So, this has been a godless culture. That's been our greatest strength. Somewhere we surrendered this. So, if there is no God, what is our goal? The goal is always realizing the nature of the existence or realizing the truth of the existence and liberating yourself. Liberation is the goal. God is not the goal, heaven is not the goal. Heaven is attractive only for those who made a hell out of themselves. Yes. If you're having a great life here, after some time, it's wonderful, but it's enough. You get bored with good life, no? Don't you? Those who are not having a good life thinking one day, I'm going to be great, but those who have a good life, they're quite bored with it. Okay, what next? Enough of pleasure and comfort and everything, health. Everything is boring, you want to die when you're well <laughs> So if we send you to heaven also the same thing will happen. And anyway, does anybody here have proof that you're not already in heaven? Do you have proof? Well, maybe we're already in heaven, maybe you're making a mess out of it. <laughs>